Welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 and Crisis Management, Business Resilience. My name is Hong Fei. I'm a program director at MIT Corporate Relations. On behalf of MIT Industrial Liaison Program, I will be your host today. Since its founding in 1948, MIT Industrial Liaison Program has served as a gateway connecting corporate members with MIT research and the larger MIT innovation ecosystem, including MIT connected startups. To learn more about the program and see if your company should be part of that, please go to our website, ilp.mit.edu. Today, we are very delighted to deliver to you another webinar in the COVID-19 series. Our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Goldman. Dr. Goldman is a senior lecturer at MIT Professional Education. He is an internationally recognized expert in business continuity, crisis management, disaster recovery, and crisis communications. In the next hour or so, he will discuss several important issues relevant to pandemic crisis management and business resilience. He will also discuss the importance of leadership during a crisis and take a look of the eventual road to recovery. Steve, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating. I appreciate it. I know sitting at home watching a PowerPoint presentation really wasn't on your list of top things to do in this year, but let's have a go at it. So as Hong said, we're going to talk about uh, crisis management and business resiliency with referring to the COVID-19 virus that's going around, pandemic. OK, here's today's agenda. I'll briefly talk about crisis management, business resiliency. I want to talk about leadership in a crisis. The middle part is preparation, recovery, and preparing for the next one. I want to spend a few minutes uh, discussing uh, research I'm doing on work from home, and then a couple of issues on how the media is covering the COVID-19 pandemic. I will summarize, and this will be followed by a standing ovation on your part while you are at home. OK, uh, that's me, and obviously I need to update my picture. Um, uh, two degrees in engineering from MIT, um, UMass doctorate. Spent a lot of time in crisis management, business continuity. You can read all that. I uh, senior lecturer at MIT crisis courses, and I do consult on the side. You can see my areas of expertise. I won't read it to you, but uh, quite a, quite an interesting career. I've always enjoyed it. It's always been fascinating. People I've met have just been fantastic. So can't complain. All right. So the first thing we want to talk about is common sense should prevail okay there's no hard fast rules in crisis management it's not a science it's more of an art so adapt what you hear and, and see in this presentation to your specific needs and your organization okay so let's talk about crisis management business resiliency now here's a definition a crisis is essentially a complex and unexpected event that creates instability damage and threats to company and people well da we are in the middle of a crisis uh, by definition. So we all should know that, but I just want you to understand from a base load. Now, crisis areas come in different sizes and shapes. It could be an IT disaster, data breach, or everything else is working fine, manufacturing problem, uh, a mess up by one of your senior executives, something organization specific, your secret formula ends up on the web, or one of your executives makes a, a bad decision and the company's paying for it. And of course, pandemic. So crises come in all different sizes and shapes. The basic response, the basic timeline would be this. Something, you know, before the crisis, before the disaster, you have plans, you have procedures, you test them, and you continually improve them. Then a disaster will hit. Notice like I'm saying, not if, I'm saying when. Everyone's going to go through a crisis, and today's a fine example of one. So people respond, you do what you have to do, and then eventually, the business units will recover, and this could be government as well as business. Uh, critical processes first, other processes next. And then it's either business as usual or what we're seeing with the pandemic, it's going to be business as modified. And we'll talk about that a little later on in the presentation. Now this is something else, uh, a reality check. When it comes to a crisis, you've got no options. You know, you've got to participate. And how you handle it can make you or break you and over the years, year after year, drill after drill, event after event, it's a common factor that communication is the toughest part of any crisis. 
So the basic tenet of crisis management is that day-to-day -day operations not suited for a crisis. They designed to run your company normally, you know, extract oil from the ground and sell it for two or three dollars a gallon. That's, that's quite the miracle. Uh, when that doesn't work, you're in a crisis, you've got to adapt. So you set up an organization to focus on the crisis. And let me ask you, has your company or organization set up a pandemic response team and exercise the pandemic response team prior to the pandemic. If you have good for you, you should be reasonably, you should have been reasonably well prepared. If you haven't, you're learning on the job. Here we go. Now this is something again, I want you to take back with you. The key expectation of senior management and the key expectation of your government is you're prepared to respond. Okay, you're prepared to respond. You can't say we didn't expect it, there's been enough precursors for pandemics to know, going back to 1918, one could happen. And we weren't prepared, you should have been prepared. Ah, but Dr. Steve, uh, do we expect one of this ferocity and, and this scale? No, we didn't. But still, the principles are the same. Uh, you should have expected it, you should have been prepared, and you work together to make it happen. That's what people are thinking. Other things you need to do are focus on leadership, uh, take the actions to resolve it. This is what we're expecting. Teamwork, no fighting among yourselves. Work as a team. Communicate and work with people. Help people cope with the crisis. And you can read the other things. The key thing there is rebuilding your people. It's one thing to rebuild a building, a data center, or a structure. You have to rebuild your staff. That's the most critical thing that you have to do. To summarize, basically, executives, senior management level, uh, ministers, presidents, whatever, show up and do your job. Lead the company, lead the organization out of the crisis, show up and do the job you're supposed to do. All right, let's talk about leadership in a crisis. And I wanna thank colleagues of mine from that, um, that little liberal arts school upriver from MIT, what's it called? Um, oh yeah, Harvard, uh, their National Preparedness Leadership Initiative provided the next couple of slides. I work with them a lot, and I've got some props for them at the end of the presentation. So again, thanks guys. So what is leadership? People following you, which is an easy thing to talk about. So what I want you to think about is something that the NPLI is really big on, which is called meta-leadership. So meta-leadership is relatively simple. You are the person. You are surrounded by your situation. Okay, so what we're talking about is connectivity. Connect to the people around you and uh, or, uh, around you. First, what you connect to is you lead down. The people who work through your staff, your, your um, employees, etc. You lead down with the situation. Whoops. You lead up. Everyone has a boss. Everyone has a manager. Everyone has an overseer, an overlord. So whether you're a person on the front lines, you're a senior level executive, you're a CEO, you're a prime minister, you're the president, you have people you report to and work for, lead up, keep them informed. To the left, you lead across, lead across your organization, the business units, we talk about silos. In a crisis, you have to get rid of the silos, work together. Then to the right, lead beyond. Keep your other organizations, other industries, everyone, informed your customers, your clients, the citizens, inform them what you're doing and show them your leadership. So again, I'm, I'm summarizing a, a two hour session into one slide, but again, consider meta leadership as part of what you do. And I love this quote, autonomy of action for the parts is unity of action for the whole is what you want. General Mike Hayden said that. So think about this. You want individual response units, organizations, to do their job, to show up and do their job and do what they need to do because they know what they're doing. But you want unity of action for the whole. You're all rowing in the same direction. You're all running the same marathon. You all have the same goal in the future that you want to go to. So autonomy of action for the parts, unity of action for the whole. Let's talk about preparing and response. This is a list, again, I won't read it to you, but things you need to think about and you should have had, and I'm sure some of you are developing this on the fly, policies and procedures, 
contact list. You can read through this. Vital records, if we can't access our building, how are we gonna access our vital records? Simple things like writing a check. How do you write a check offline or uh, at home? Employee, uh, you can read the uh, employee and customer protection, infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. You can see that, but you should have had a pandemic response team ready to go. Response, I told you before, I'll tell you again. Communications, communications, communications. What is your general strategy? Is it work from home? Is it partial shutdown, a temporary shutdown, or full shutdown? So again, in responding to this pandemic, you've got your strategy up and running. This is a tough one, the tough decisions. Um, I, I feel so badly for people who are laid off or furloughed or let go because of the pandemic. They didn't do anything, no one did anything, but the strategy for keeping the company afloat was, you know, in this, some cases, furloughs. Really tough, My empathy goes out to everybody. Also, as part of your response, can you do meetings? Uh, facility, oh, this is interesting. Facility cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. I did not know that, but those are three separate actions. Cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting is um, move, remove, and kill to boil it down. So it's not disinfecting and cleaning are two separate things as an example. You can read the rest, social distancing, supply chain management. My colleague Yossi Sheffi gave a presentation in this exact same format two or three, four weeks ago on supply chain management. What you need to do, what can you learn? How can you prepare? Very good. Okay. And you can read the others, vendor supplies and vital records. Some actions, leadership, creativity. I talk about do your job, do your job. What are your strategies? Remote or work from home, cross training, fewer people on the job, minimizing entries, mutual aid. Work with your organizations, uh, you know, university to university, vendor to vendor, company to company and see what common areas you have. Sometimes work with your competitors. So you're both in the same boat, you're both rowing for the same direction. Continuous update, please keep your people informed. Please let them know what's going on. And you can read the others. Start planning for recovery now. Gather your lessons learned now. What will be the new normal? How will you deal with social distancing in the workplace? How will you deal with shipping, the shipping dock, for example, incoming and outgoing? So think about that, start gathering your lessons learned now and start planning for recovery. These next few slides are from a student of mine who was in my crisis class. I worked for a company as a consultant, he's a good friend. These slides, I think I'm gonna go through them quickly. They're communication tools to talk to people within the organization. So upper left, where are we? We're in a predictable survival transition. Well, now, We've passed survival, unpredictable, you're now in survival. What are our priorities? And you can read them in the middle. Lower left, what are the impact, health and business? This graph here from World Health Organization. So what my friend did was he moves the star every week, depending upon what's going on. So if you look at this as a communications tool, and the star is all, all the way to the left, you can see it's gonna get worse. You can prepare for it's gonna get worse. The last week or so, he moved the star from the top, over to the right, this shows people where it's getting better. It's gonna get a little worse later on, the second wave, but it's gonna get better. And it gives people hope that we know what we're doing, we're planning this out, know where we are, this is very good. So again, good job. A couple more, now look at this one, it's very complicated, I understand that, but if you think about it, you've got the production operation and the office operation. This is for a large petrochemical company, a multinational petrochemical company, in Southeast Asia. And so you can see just the quality of the graphics alone, very simple, but very uh, detailed. It tells you exactly what's going on. On the right, what we're doing with operations and what we're doing with the office and common policy, no critical staff to high risk areas. Again, in one little graphic, and it's, it's complex, I, I grant you that, but it shows people this is what we're doing, this is the plan, this is how we're gonna communicate with people. This is more about employees, the upper left critical staff. They're gonna be put up in nearby hotels so they can keep the factories running. Core staff is gonna work from home and office staff is gonna work from home. And down in the middle, they have a family rescue plan so that employees don't feel isolated, families don't feel left alone. We have a 
good situation showing people, that, yes, we care about you, this will work. This was good about health screening. Uh, health screening and workplace hygiene, you can read what, what they're doing about the processes and the screening and the cameras and whatnot. The interesting part is on the right, they show pictures of what they're gonna be doing, so it's not a surprise. Don't walk into an office and see all this equipment. It's like, my goodness, what is all this about? They're preparing people for what's gonna happen. So again, uh, continuity of, of, of uh, business. In this particular case, they have a massive construction project that they just cannot shut down. So they're gonna make the appropriate adapt adaptations to make sure the construction project can move on. This is how they communicate that out. Social distancing and critical staff area being controlled. Again, on the left is what we're gonna do. On the right are pictures how we're gonna do it. So it's not a surprise. In the uh, left middle, there's something called the shoe distance effect. So when you walk in, uh, it's, uh, it's tape, tape face up that you're supposed to step on and bring your shoes to clean off your shoes. How many people thought of that? They did, and they are going to have it as part of the uh, processes. You can see even to the right, there's how we're gonna sterilize people. Again, I don't know the details, but this is the planning that's gone into place with this company. Employee health, big concern. So they have an app, uh, self-declared and, and uh, monitored. So you click on the app, you go through the process. Again, I don't know the details. And it sends out a form to whomever to analyze your health data so it keeps people informed, but you can check your own health. So again, the employees, we care about you. Critical areas, again, um, screening areas, critical staff is 450 people. All employees at this facility, 5,500. So again, it's telling people what we're gonna do as far as health. So screening process for the critical, self-declare for the 5,500. And again, everyone is told what they're gonna be doing. Finally, the last slide of theirs is um, the communications program. It needs to be fleshed out a little more, but they get one set up, how we're gonna do it, how we verify information, who we send it out to, and how we're gonna communicate. So again, Crit Pond, I owe you a lobster, very good slides, very good. Thank you for letting me share them. Let's talk about recovery. Now, one thing I want you to think about is there are three foundations to every organization, people, facilities, and connectivity. Without all three, you, you can't have an organization. Even if the facilities are home, you're somewhere doing what you have to do. And for those of you not affiliated with MIT, that is in fact one of our buildings. It's building 32, the Stata Center. The architect did not crumble up the diagrams and plans and send it to the constructor. That is how it looks. It's really quite the site. That's where we hold our crisis class. Okay, recovery. Start planning now. Don't wait for the thing to be over. You don't know when it's gonna end. Start thinking about how we're gonna recover. What's it gonna take? open up a building? What HR issues do we have to deal with? Are we gonna monitor people? What about social distancing? You can read in the blue, what are the dependencies? Do I bring back all departments? Or do I bring them back one by one? If one by one, which one comes first? So what is your order for restoration of your, your organization? Are you going to monitor employees' health? And what are your policies? What happens if someone comes down with the virus or someone has a coughing fit in the office, what are your policies? This needs to be worked out ahead of time. Safety and security, I mean, you can read the rest, social distancing, you're gonna have meetings or even within a floor in a building, are you gonna have uh, virtual meetings and just not gather people together? The proverbial water cooler gatherings, now that's gonna go away, that's gonna be the new normal. What about break rooms? What are you gonna do with that? So again, all these issues you need to plan and think about. Now we talked about supply chain. That's one thing to make something, a car or cement, but if you can't distribute it, what's the point? So you need to also look at your distribution chain, uh, make sure that both, both chains, supply and distribution, are started, balanced, and ready to go. Talked about supplies. We may joke about toilet paper, but in this country, but you know, restocking, distributing your supplies is gonna be very important. Mail services, that's, I'll, uh, I'll share my research later. That's a key concern about people with work from home. And then what projects do you have that have started and stopped or underway? Well, you're gonna bring those back or 
not do them at all. So again, these are the concerns you want to think about. Now this slide I developed for the pandemic manual we saw in the introduction. Um, starting at the top, government clearly, for everyone to re-enter, government's got to let loose, let loose, let go. Uh, relax the shelter in place, restore public transportation, relax the shutdown. Now this is written more for facilities, but the, the points are, are going to be made. Um, landlords got a whole bunch of things to do. You can read all that. The occupier, which would be mostly you, you've got those policies we talked about, social distancing, floor plans, posting signs, selective re-entry, some people, and then, you know, does it work? And then full entry and reopening of your building. Ultimately, though, it's down to the individual, the bottom block. They are the ultimate decision maker upon re-entry. Are they going into work or not? They need to be confident that you've done everything you can to make sure the building is healthy and safe. And they also have family concern. You know, uh, two kids at home, not going back to school, but the office wants me in. What do I do? So these are the types of current concerns people will be having before they re-enter their buildings. So again, I want you to think about these for uh, when you start doing your recovery planning. Now, I call this mask confusion or mask chaos. So let's say the government has lifted the face mask requirement, people come back to work, you walk around and you notice four different scenarios. Number one, all staff still wearing face masks. Number two, most staff are wearing face masks, a few do not. Number three, a few staff are wearing face masks, most do not. And number four, none of the staff are wearing face masks. Okay, could this be a problem? Well, think about it. Number one and number four, consistency reigns. And so you're in good shape. The problem with two and three, it's because we're humans. If everybody's wearing a face mask and a few people are not, people may look down on them, shun, shun them, shame them. Uh, why aren't you wearing a face mask? What's wrong with you? On the other hand, if a few people still wear face masks, the human tendency is, well, what's wrong with that person? Why aren't they out of the face mask? So you need a policy for this. If you were like in a restaurant or cafeteria and you see all the staff has masks, fine. If you do, if you don't, you're gonna be wondering, just human nature. So this is one of those little things that comes up that you need to think about when you're doing your restoration to your buildings. Now, I keep talking about employees. On the left, make sure your employees are covered. Make sure you care about your employees. They may have short-term, long-term, medium-term, and long-term issues. Personal issues, family issues, financial issues. They, you know, they're human too. So monitor their staff, monitor their health, make sure your counseling is available, some kind of EAP, employee assistance program, something like that. Uh, the tendency is to overwork people once we, we get them back in. Well, we don't, we, you know, we laid off 25% of our staff. You guys have to take out the slack. Well, that works to a point. And on the right is what we call the human function curve. This is, it's available by different authors all throughout the internet. I just picked the one that had the best looking graph. So you can see on the left, on the Y axis, so to speak, there's performance. On the cross axis, the X axis is stress. So Stress versus performance. So clearly no stress, no performance. No big deal there. But the more stress you put on people, you know, it's healthy. They start performing and they do a good job. And everyone has a comfort zone where some amount of stress X gives pretty good performance Y. And life is good. And sometimes you push people a little and, you know, okay, I can perform a little more with a little more stress. That deadline that shows up, that last minute project. The adrenaline is flowing, so you, you can get a little more output. What problems, what happens is people reach a hump and they start getting fatigued. And they go over the hump and the more stress you put on people, the less you get out of them, the less performance there is. So that's not a good thing. So please be aware of this curve, the human function curve, when it comes to your employees. Preparing for the next one. You don't want to think about it, but yeah. It's going to happen. So to prepare for the next one, you got to learn and improve from this one. So what I want you to do is now, today, this week, start conducting in-incident reviews. In other words, it's not over. 
start talking to people what's working, what's not working, what needs to be improved. After it's over, at some point, you'll conduct a post-incident critique, again, among departments, among executives, among staff. Again, what worked, what didn't work, what did we learn, where do we want to go? Gather documentation and files. Conduct individual interviews, you know, one-on-ones with people. And then I want you to come up with your post-pandemic action plan. I'll show you a slide in a couple of minutes. Come up with that plan, and that is your guidance for the next X amount of months to get yourself ready for the next one. You update your plans, procedures, facilities, supplies, et cetera. Just make it happen so you're prepared for the next one. Now, I recommend you do this. Use this template. Each observation, each challenge, each item, each thing that went wrong, each thing that went right, you know, document it and, and, and granular, make it granular. Don't say, you know, we need, we need more people for the crisis team, or pandemic team. What position specifically? Whom do you need? When should they show up? What areas? Come up with a recommendation, a resolution. Then the last three columns are the real important ones. Right? Once I've identified the events and the uh, uh, comments, put someone in charge, give them a completion date. And I love using the stoplight chart on the right. If you just say, well, we need, you know, we need, we need a larger command center. Well, who's responsible for that? We need to look at the laws re, re, uh, re, regarding work at home. Who's responsible for that? This, we need to, doesn't, go, doesn't cut anything. You need to assign a, a specific task to people. So here you can see that uh, there's a red, yellow light, red, yellow, green stoplight chart. This is a great tool, if you will, for shaming people. I don't like that phrase, but if you're an executive and you see your department is all reds and everyone else's departments are greens, you're gonna start getting action done. So as a tool for you people to use to get other people to work, this has never failed. Okay, um, I wanna talk about a couple other issues, if I may. I'm doing some research, uh, one of my students and I are doing some research on work from home. It's not quantitative, it's strictly qualitative. It's just, what are your impressions? So right now we have 40 companies responded, expecting some more. Interestingly, for the average, 95% of their staff are working at home. I was kind of amazed. However, and there is a split, manufacturing organizations are between five and 30%. Now, of course it makes sense, can't build a car, can't make concrete, pour concrete from home. So this makes sense. Now the key result and the key trend and few business continuity people, this should not be a surprise, is you had a plan and you exercised work from home, it worked. You had fewer problems and a faster startup than those who didn't. A lot of people complained, well, we did work from home and I did a follow-up, did you have a plan? Well, no. Did you, test, did you have a plan and test it? Well, no. Um, they, they were they were you know doing new ground on, on you know on the fly it was just not good so you business continuity people yeah this is no big deal you know this the rest of you for the next time make sure you plan an exercise that's going on so some results communications worked well for the most part especially with daily meetings and people loved having the CEO do a weekly conference call giving them an update they felt empowered they felt they belonged and you can read the others some people reported productivity went up i kind of don't see that but you know that's fine too a lot of people are enjoying this new normal they like working from home on the other side what did not work well i call this family interference for lack of a better word keeping work life balance was problematic for a lot of people if you're working it from home and both parents are home and the kids are home, it's not gonna be easy to work from home. Some companies are expecting people to work on weekends. Hey, you're at home anyway, so let's have a meeting Saturday or some meetings at eight o'clock at night. Uh, that's just not working. A lot of bad feelings within the family. Several people I talked to when both parents work, like one spouse works from seven in the morning to one in the afternoon, the other spouse from one in the afternoon to seven in the evening, they just do a a split shift at home, they can take care of their children. Um, it's a very interesting uh, result. <laughs> Another thing people are saying is there's too many meetings. 
since people have Zoom or Teams or Hangout, they're using it probably a little too much. And so let's have a meeting. Okay, well, and their, their schedule gets built up. So that was kind of interesting. Most, a lot of companies have problems with mail, strangely enough. Post office, UPS, FedEx, Amazon, they're all working. Where do they deliver mail to and how do we get that distributed? Some uh, customers, uh, customer facing organizations, you know, customers who want one on ones, they, they can't sell, you can't market over, you know, on a Zoom meeting. So that was one of the big things. That was kind of interesting. Uh, some of the things that, uh, that happened. Improvements, understanding dependencies and interdependencies. I need to do X, but I need, I need A, B, and C before I can do C, D, and F. Oh, I didn't know that. Now, the business continuity people should have in your business impact analysis, a lot of this information. But still, making it real, making it happen was interesting. A lot of people need to print things out at home and don't have printers. And um, that's something people need to supply. This one was interesting. People wanted a work from home uh, for on the fly policies. In other words, a work from home czar. You're at home, you have an HR issue, you've got an issue with working from home. Who do I call? How do I find out the answer to this information? So a lot of companies to set up the work from home czar. That's the person or that's the call you make kind of like a call center when you have a problem with specific work from home issues. People like flexible hours. Um, again, we talked about one through seven, seven through one. So that was very interesting. A lot of people, especially the finance people, said, well, we just handed out laptops and now we can't track them. So, okay, well, now you know for the future, that's something you have to do. A lot of companies are saying we're gonna keep more people home after the uh, pandemic is over than we do now. Key lesson learned is we can do this. To training, a lot of companies are saying no more lap, no more desktops, laptops for everybody, and you can read through the rest. Um, a couple of companies said, you know, <laughs> we need to develop and impl implement what they call Zoom manners. Apparently, some people don't go on mute when they should, and some things get spread over the company meeting that really shouldn't. No one cares if you're wearing pants, for example. Mute yourself. Don't show us the video. We don't care. Um, uh, when people talk, who you know, the loudest one doesn't necessarily necessarily need to be the first one, et cetera, et cetera. So little things like that you don't think about to actually implement what's going on. As I talked before, monitor and adapt, monitor and adjust, make sure your plans are flexible. And guess what? The key lesson learned was, hey, the worst can actually happen. It did, we're undergoing it now. So be prepared. Okay, um, I'm gonna venture off into the news media area just, just for a little bit. Um, um, people have compared this pandemic to fighting a war. It's not a bad analogy. We are fighting a war against the unseen enemy. The, uh, the Greek philosopher, Aeschylus back in 550 BC said, in war, truth is the first casualty. And in this war on pandemic, truth is becoming, if not a casualty, a very bendable product. So I wanna show you these two items. Recently, um, you can read it, uh, the, the story of the week was uh, how Korea is just beating our tails in the United States on testing. And that was the issue, the flavor of the week you know, three or four weeks ago. And it's true, we were, we were behind Korea. But what they didn't tell you, and I did some research on this, was the reason Korea has done such a good job is they had a MERS outbreak, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome outbreak, back um, three, or three or five years ago. And they didn't do so well. I just phrase it that way. They did, they did not do a great job. And they got criticized up, down, and back and forth. So. What did they do? They learned from the past. They implemented for the future. And when our pandemic, our pandemic, the current pandemic hit, they were prepared. They had ventilators, they had masks, they had testing, they had this, that, and everything else. Why? Because they expected it, they prepared for it. And my friend who wrote, wrote me about this said they set up the uh, command and control center uh, last year and kept it up and running. A month before 
the COVID-19 outbreak started in China, South Korea did an exercise and just this. So a lot of preparation and a little luck. So when COVID-19 hit, they were prepared. I'm not taking anything away from South Korea. They did a great job in preparing. But when you see news stories like this, look behind the scenes and see what's going on. Another thing I want to bring up is data. And this is from uh, Johns Hopkins University. They update this every evening. This is uh, about 36 hours ago. If you look at this, it's like, my Lord, look at this. We, the United States, are leading virtually almost three times as many deaths as everybody else in the world. Oh my God, what is wrong with the United States? Well, these are numbers that need to be looked at. And if you look at confirmed cases, well, if you do no testing, you get no confirmed cases. If you do a few tests, you get a few confirmed cases, even if the percentages are the same. If you do a gazillion tests, you're gonna get quite a few confirmed cases. So if you look at the last column, deaths per 100,000 population, you get this chart. And we're down you know, in the mid range of what's going on. So it's not as bad and some numbers are shown to you. And Spain and Italy, yeah, you hear the news, you understand that they're pretty serious. I had no idea that Belgium on a per population, per capita basis was so high up there. So again, Johns Hopkins University, you can see the website, look at the numbers. And, and, and when you see something on TV or the radio or the internet, look behind the numbers and see what they're trying to do. See where the actual truth is. Because you know, my, my philosophy is I don't believe anything on social media. I only be able to believe half, not even half, of regular media. I do believe the CDC, but that's, that's me personally. All right, wrapping it up, let's look at some resources. Uh, the rolling credits in the beginning, we talked, uh, you saw about the MIT Crisis Management Business Continuity course. Um, you can see that is last year's class. Look how happy they are, They're just heads full of good information. Can't wait to bring it back. And each one of them had a lobster, so that was good. This year, we're going online because of the pandemic. So instead of offering, offering you know, five days, we're doing three days over two weeks, three half days a week over two weeks, plus a couple of optional training items and exercise and uh, a few uh, virtual live things. So this is where we're going. That's the um, website to sign up. So please sign up, come on board. We'll do this live. It'll be a lot of fun, but you will learn a lot. I make jokes about my friends over at Harvard and uh, Harvard MIT. Uh, rivalry is, is always the place, but Eric and Lenny and his crew have set up the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative. Um, there's a website down below. It's great training. And Eric and Lenny and, and the others have a book out called Your It. It's available on Amazon. So props to them for letting me use some slides and work with them all these years, real good. Finally, um, you saw again in the rolling opening credits, um, there's a manual out there which is free. You can download it at the International Facility Management Association, IFMA, the IFMA Foundation. It's available for free. And not only because I wrote it, but I do think that it's a great book. So, um, or in spite of the fact that I wrote it, how's that? It's a great book. So again, it's available free from the good people at the IFMA Foundation. Okay, I want to summarize. And I want to use a quote from Mom Emanuel. And you've seen the first half of this quote, which is, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. But what's more important is the second half of the quote, which is really quoted, is an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. And we are proving with this crisis, we are getting a lot done. We are learning a lot. We are getting, you know, we just, we're going to combat it and we're gonna win. Now my heart goes out for everyone who has died because that's a family. The United States was 63,000 families, whatever the number was, that's sad. But from the business, purely technical point of view, we're doing things, we're taking advantage of things, we're doing things we never thought we could do. That's a good thing. So concluding thoughts, pandemic will eventually pass. We will get through this and we will get through the crisis we will come out the better for it. This I've learned over the years, a crisis is a defining moment. It's a defining moment for people, 
defining moment for government. It's a defining moment for organizations. How well you do, how well you respond is going to be remembered for a very, very long time. So get out there, do what needs to be done, and continue doing a great job. Questions, back to you. Great, Steve. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. We do have uh, quite a few questions here, and we do have a good amount of time to go through this. So let me go through this one first. Even if this pandemic is over and coronavirus is not there, what would you envision of new normal after this pandemic? <laughs> oh boy, uh, the new normal, social distancing, I'm afraid is gonna be there forever. Uh, it's gonna, in my humble non-epidemiological non, uh, opinion, this is gonna last into 2021. Uh, with social, you know, the, the pandemic may be gone away, but social distancing, uh, the big thing in, uh, back when was the open office, that's gonna go away restaurants, uh, every other thing. So for a while, social distancing. Meetings are gonna, you know, work from home is gonna be still popular. Meetings are gonna be done uh, even within a floor, within a building, virtually. So I just see that as happening. All right, let's take the next one. Dr. Steve, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It's really impress impressive. I want to ask something about restrict individual freedom. I live in South Korea, and sometimes some people break the rules in our society. It makes serious problems in our society. So how do you think about that? How far should individual freedom will be restricted? That is a cultural situation, which is interesting because as people may know in, in the United States, we are having rebellion, you know, small scale rebellion in certain areas for people who just don't want to put up with a social distancing. And you know, I understand from the CDC's point of view, their job is to put out the health, you know, think about the health and safety of people. I understand from the business point of view, if we don't get back to work, we're not gonna have a business for people to get back to. So um, uh, it's, it's a weighing system and this is, you know, it's a, way, it's a balance. And this is what government uh, is supposed to do. Again, different cultures, uh, different organizations. Uh, here, it was a young lady in Dallas who opened up her uh, hair salon and she got praised. You know, the, the, they tried to shut her down, the government did, and the citizens said, no, 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 this is a good thing. So yeah, uh, there may be company, I'm uh, sorry, all companies, countries, cultures where one sacrifices for the larger whole. And that's, that's strictly cultural, uh, cultural thing. You know, in this country, we put up with this only for so long and then our individual freedom just wants to come out. I don't know if I answered that, but it's, it's not an easy question. All right, next question is, Dr. Steve, generally speaking, what business functions should be considered critical versus non-critical? <laughs> well, that's up to the function. <laughs> that's up to the business. Uh, the three things you bring back, like I said before, uh, facilities, people, connectivity. If you don't have those, um, you know where. Every crisis plan, every business continuity plan, the first things you bring back are those three. When I say facilities, that could be work from home. That's fine, as long as you can do your job. If you're a financial institution, 95, I've had some people say, they're all working from home, which is great. Manufacturing, like I said, you can't build a car, can't uh, provide, uh, you can't provide uh, cement, as two examples. So uh, that's done with a business impact analysis. People come in, you know, I come in and I do a, what's called the BIA and determine what's critical, what's not. What's critical for, for MIT may not be critical for Harvard. I can't I'll pick on Harvard. What's critical for a, a school with a lot of uh, veterinary and animal studies is not critical for a business school. So again, do your business impact analysis and find out what, what's important for you. There's no simple answer. All right, next one is, what do you suggest to a manager to sustain motivation of collaborators in these circumstances of crisis? Okay, communication. Keep people informed. Tell them what the, the thinking is over, you know, the, the management thinking is, what we're going to do, how we're going to get there. Keep people involved. 
it's not easy on a day-to-day -day basis. In a crisis, it's even worse. Sometimes you just call on, okay, people, we're in a crisis, we need everyone to pull together, and that works. If that only works for a certain amount of time, then you get back to your daily norm. So the, the key is communication. You keep people informed, you feel part of it. And oh, the key thing about communication, two steps, two steps. Communicate, but listen. And not just hear people, listen to people. Listen to what they're telling you, listen to what they need, listen to what they want. And if you can, by, by any stretch, make it happen. Because uh, they want to communicate, they want to know. Most people want to work. They want to get the job that they want to go back to work. So help them do that, communicate. Great. The next one is, it has been reported that a number of organizations are requiring their work from home employees to download the tracking software on their computers. So their company can monitor who is doing what during the workday, monitoring mouse movements, web pages, visited, et cetera. What do you think about this? Oh, um, personally, I would be against it, but, and, and don't, okay, I'm laughing because uh, that was one of the items that people did not like when I did my survey of work from home. It's having to do this tracking software and actually people getting called by managers saying, hey, you know, you weren't doing anything in the last 15 minutes, what's wrong? That's overkill, you know. Again, uh, the thing from General Hayden, is you know let the individuals do their jobs as long as we're all rowing in the right direction. So yeah, again that go, that goes to a cultural thing too. Some cultures they accept that overview, overlord, overtasking, better word necessary for this type of supervision. Other cultures don't. And you know I'm not a fan of it, but I and I really don't think it's necessary. You know when I was a manager, trust my people. Here you go. Here's your assignment. I expect you to get it done. If you can't come talk to me and everything is good. But a lot of managers are very, you know, what's the word? They're very close crop. They very want, pretty much want, uh, micromanage is the word I'm seeking, micromanage. And that's just something you have to put up with. I don't like it, but here we go. All right, next one. How do we extend decisions about recovery and returning to normal beyond the employees? Is there a broad understanding that exposure is not only a concern to the employee, but also the family? If an employee is expected to return to work because the company feels it's reasonably safe, but the employee has a highly vulnerable family member, should the employer be expected to make accommodations? Things like leave and other reasonable accommodations are typically for the employee only and don't consider risk beyond the employee directly. Yeah. Exactly right, Hong. Um, you've got to have a program to monitor employees. You've got to have an, I mean, eight, the H, when I write a pandemic manual for a client, the HR section is the largest. So all the issues you've got to deal with, and this is wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, your family, someone in the family is ill and you come to work, you're going to spread it. So some companies are going to the monitoring. Uh, my my uh, friend from Southeast Asia, they have a monitoring app on your cell phone. Um, this is not a pretty situation because you're dealing with human functions, human issues. Uh, it's just not pretty. So yeah, there's got to be a balance between what's good for the company and what's good for the employee. Remember in that chart, the employee is the ultimate decider as to whether he or she shows up for work. And in some cases, employees have to go to work to feed their family. So they may be a little, what's the word, liberal on, uh, on if they feel poorly, they'll still show up to work. I mean, you see that now, or before the pandemic, ill people still show up to work. This is not an easy situation. It's one of those HR issues. You, you need to plan out ahead of time. You need to let people know this is the policy. And there's no shame if you're not feeling well, or your family's not feeling well, fine. You know, HR needs to be flexible. I know a lot of companies are letting people have flex time, letting people have much more sick time than necessary. Like, stay home. If you're ill, stay home. Don't worry about it. And those are the, um, you know, the excellent companies that do this. So yeah, this is not a tough issue. Not an easy issue. It's a very tough issue. All right, next one. How does your process work if, for instance, there is a return to normal and then there is a second wave? Yep, start all over again. It's expect the second wave. Uh, the second wave in the 1918 pandemic was actually worse than the first wave. 
because everybody thought, hey, it's over, let's go out and party, literally. And uh, the second wave was actually worsened. And there's also a third wave. So expect the second wave, plan for it. I've all these policies in place. And again, that chart where um, you can see, you know, the, the WHO chart, you know, have something like that to let people know we, we got it, we know what's going on, and we're monitoring it. So again, I wish I had simple answers, but going back to the beginning, this is not a science. It's an art, and we're uh, learning as we go along in some areas. So, Steve, next question is for specific for recovery phase. So, using FDA review as an example, we are learning about necessary versus excessive fitness protocols. When is it appropriate to institute new protocols versus adapting established protocols to new normal? Uh, like I said, monitor and adjust. I, I can't give specific guidance. I would have to look at your company and uh, you know, see what's going on. Or I, I have a health agency come in and look. Uh, again, I, I'm always gonna go back to communicate whatever you're planning on doing before you implement something and then do it, uh, let people know what you're up to. Again, I, I wish I had, yes, do A, B, and C, and there's the answer, but it just doesn't work that way for this disease. All right. So next question. One thing I missed as a planner was work-life balance for employees. Many plans probably do not have it in their plans. Agree too that hours to work are insane. My workload is almost too much. Thankfully, we have started to recognize this as a company and are starting to implement things like take Tuesdays where no one is allowed to schedule meetings after 1 p.m. Also right. given Friday early release to employee. Any comment on that? Yes, that's, that's necessary. Like I keep saying, adapt or monitor and adapt. But think about your employees. No employees, no company. It's as simple as that. The robot revolution hasn't taken over yet, so we're still there. Um, yeah, you get flexible HR hours. I like the idea of you know, no meeting Tuesdays, let people go home Fridays or work on the weekends and take Wednesday off or something like that. So yeah, uh, the advanced companies, the thoughtful companies are doing just such policies. So good, good job. Next one, crisis management happens post-event. Though you are talking about preparedness, would you think that here the issue crosses into risk management rather than crisis management and BCP? Okay, crisis management occurs before the issue starts. You should have a team set up, ready to go, backups, facilities, procedures, policies, or whatever. And you activate the team when the event starts. So it doesn't occur afterwards. So um, I'm not quite sure what, what the rest of the question is, but the, the premise you know, needs to be looked at. You set up your team. In fact, when you write a pandemic plan, you can see it coming. You're gonna get World Health Organization, uh, CDC, different comp uh, organizations telling you yeah, it's coming down the road. So uh, that's when you start getting your pandemic plan up and running. So again, a pandemic response team, a crisis management team, up and running ahead of time. Yeah, no two ways about it. All right, next question. Are you aware of any studies or benchmarks regarding recovery plans for church-based organizations in a pandemic that can be learned from? No, actually, that's an interesting question. Specifically for church-based organizations, no. Um, no, that'd be an interesting one to look at. I, I guess you follow the rules that your state and county in the United States put out. And um, I know they're thinking about social distancing within pews and, and all that stuff and just follow that. But I have not heard of any of uh, uh, My last slide has got my contact information, so we should show that. And if anyone knows anything, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, it sounds like a good Google search. Right, okay. So what do you think of the fate of the factories would be how would the factories change their styles of producing goods going forward? Well, social distancing. I mean, you saw what uh, my friend from Southeast Asia, they're, they're plotting it out. They're separating uh, work functions. They're, they're no longer close. Um, you know, bring in an expert on, on environment, or bring in environmental health and safety people and have them plot out what needs to be done. It may take longer to build the car or, or make the cement. That's the sacrifice you're going to have to make. Um, a lot, I know like in construction, at least around here, they're still building buildings because 
you know, they're practicing social distancing. So it's going to take a study, it's going to take a survey of what we can do to minimize interaction, to minimize people dealing with each other. Even, you know, handing off a tool or a part, do we need to clean it when it goes from person A to person B, not a conveyor belt or just from desk to desk? Um, so, and uh, personal protective equipment needs to be added. Yeah, but it's going to take a good study to take that happen, to make that happen, yes. All right, as work from home is becoming common, I think HR development like training, OJT, et cetera, will become more difficult. How can I do for our younger generation work autonomously as the manager? Yeah, actually it's kind of funny because the younger generation is used to this type of interaction. Um, you know, you tell a young kid you're working from home on your computer, it's like, okay, so what? Um, but yeah, again, uh, if you can't meet them, you know, try to do some uh, person to person because that's where human, that, that's what we do best. But again, keep them involved, keep them informed, communicate with them. Uh, it's not a great answer, but you just got to keep at it. You got to keep talking to them. And again, I go back to listen to their concerns. What does it take to make us work together well? So communicate two ways, listening as well as talk, speaking. All right, next question is about media. So media treatment of the science is highly polarized. How should we manage this division in current management, lessons learned and planning? Uh, I, I, I could do an hour, just I could do a day on news media, uh, just on the pandemic coverage alone. You gotta, you gotta what we call drill down, you gotta find the truth. Uh, the example I gave about South Korea, uh, yeah, they, they're beating the United States in testing, but you know that's because they had the problem five years ago and they fixed it. So um, I, again, I, I think I mentioned this before. I, I I don't believe anything on social media. I I don't believe the the mainstream media too much, uh, without doing some research. I'll believe the CDC, you know, and 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 some governments. I mean, if you look at the data, some governments like they're just off their numbers are just they don't look right and so again if you don't do enough testing you don't report the right results your numbers are going to look great but it's not going to be truthful so again just drill down get get a the, get just get different opinions ask people where they get this information again do some research on, on 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 why things are the way they are just don't rely on them rely on your local and state health departments they've got the right information we have uh, two minutes left for questions. Maybe we'll go through a few more. What is your sense as to the number of companies, entities that had pandemic plan prior to this? A lot of them, a lot of companies had pandemic plans, but they never tested them. So, yep, we got a plan that's sitting in the back over there, no problem. They never tested it. A lot of companies said, yeah, we can do work from home. They never tested that. Uh, I, I've gone into many, many companies and, you know, analyzing their crisis planning, business continuity, and they say, oh yeah, we've got VPN, we can have people work from home if we lose this building. Well, VPN in some cases only handled 30% of the company because they never thought everybody's going to work from home. And so uh, you do that like, oh, didn't realize that, something to fix. So, yeah, you know, the, the basic answer is test it out, make sure that it works having a pandemic plan, you know, now's the time to learn, you've got one, uh, make it work. But again, companies that had plans and exercise them, just having a plan is not good enough. You have to exercise it also. Um, those are the ones who are successful. The ones who just had plans were ahead of the game, but not completely at the end of the game. All right, so maybe the next, the last uh, question. How do you see the effect of COVID-19 on business globalization trend? Will local for local prevail? How about impact on MNCs? Will there be new normal also? Okay, I'm not quite sure what the caller bet on that question. Yeah, so uh, the, the question I was reading is, how do you think the effect of COVID-19 on business globalization trend? Will local for local prevail? How oh, okay. about impact on MNCs and multinational corporations? Will there be new normal as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the one of the things I found from my study was across country, not across countries, the, the guidance differed. So in country A, you could have social distancing. Distancing in company B, uh, you couldn't leave your house. 
uh, country C, they're monitoring, they have guards out in front of houses, literally. So yeah, uh, globalization is gonna take a hit because now people are learning, you know, it was cheap to buy products from another country, now we can't get the products, so what's the point? So I see that, I see like a huge in the next year or two, and this is not my area of expertise, but I just do see in a year or two, um, people saying, okay, uh, we'll pay more, but we'll have it homegrown. And that's what we're just gonna have to do. Great, Steve. We have more questions we can uh, answer right now. So we have to wrap up. Well, thank you so much for the thought-provoking thought provoking presentation.